By 1880, upper-class Americans had discovered, as had their British counterparts, the delights of fare more sophisticated than their national cuisine. In the years since the outbreak of the Civil War, the ranks and fortunes of the very wealthy in America had grown enormously. Fueled by Civil War bonanzas and the rapidly accruing profits of industrial and commercial expansion, businessmen in post-Civil War America had amassed fortunes unheard of among the wealthiest of the antebellum elite. Awash in wealth, the new upper-class steamrolled through the older elite of more modest resources, marrying its daughters, buying its properties, and casting aside the simpler, more Republican tastes and manners of previous generations. In their view, a new age of elegance was being inaugurated. Their own culinary heritage may have been abundant, but it had little in the way of elegance to offer, so they turned to Europe, in particular to the cuisine and dining manners of France. The French tradition was by no means a mystery to the American elite. French food had been synonymous with elegance and sophistication in America long before the Civil War. Many Americans, among them Thomas Jefferson, had returned from travels in Europe with a reverence for French food. French chefs had migrated to New Orleans in the early 1800s, exerting a lasting influence on that city's cuisine, and some of New York City's finer hotels hired French chefs shortly thereafter. Since its founding in 1832, Delmonico's restaurant in New York City functioned as a major beachhead of French food, stimulating an appreciation among the Northeastern elite. The rush of gold seekers to San Francisco after 1849 also sparked a rush of French chefs to the Bay Area as newly rich miners bought a taste of the elegant life symbolized by French cuisine. However, the taste for French food never entered the mainstream. Jefferson enjoyed his fine French foods and wines in private, but avoided proselytizing it as he did so many other of his whims. New Orleans developed a wonderful variation on French cooking, but it remained a regional cuisine, affecting the national diet hardly at all. Delmonico spawned a number of antebellum imitators, but together they influenced only a small number of the elite, mainly New Yorkers. There was not merely an indifference to French food. As Whig politico Thurlow Weed wrote, there was a general prejudice against fancy French cooking. He and his party successfully exploited this in defeating the New York Jacksonian Martin Van Buren in his bid for re-election to the presidency in 1840. Van Buren's weakness for French food, denoted by his hiring a French chef for the White House, was used against him in a smear campaign labeling him an aristocrat intent on the restoration of monarchy. The Whig candidate, William Henry Harrison, was extolled as living on raw beef and salt. Middle-class cookbook authors who tried to apply lessons learned from the French to American cooking were defensive about it. In their household manual, the Beecher sisters pleaded that they should be able to take some leaves from foreign books without accusations of foreign foppery. Their suggestions that American housewives serve smaller, more attractive-looking cuts of meat were met with, Oh, we can't give time here in America to go into niceties and French whim-whams. In her 1877 cookbook, Juliette Corson felt compelled to defend herself against the charge that undue preference was being given to foreign ways of cooking by citing the thriftiness of French cooking. These defenses were of simple French bourgeois cuisine, with its economical pot au feu and scrap-ingesting stockpots, rather than the haute cuisine of Delmonico's and the beau monde of Paris. Yet it was the latter cuisine that now inspired the American upper classes, eagerly taking their cues from the French capital. 